Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. It is Monday and it's going to be a very, very busy week. The January 6th committee will hold its first public hearing, which promises to be um, kind of a... I think it's going to be interesting. Uh, we have this report out of Axios that they have hired a former ABC News executive who is a documentary filmmaker, the guy who apparently ran Dateline. And he's putting together you know, quite a presentation. They're treating it like it is a television show. Um, you know, The hearing will be a mix of live witnesses, pre-produced video. Uh, apparently, they have uh, they've gained access to official White House photographs from January 6th that have never been seen publicly before. And apparently, this is intriguing, only a fraction of the surveillance footage from inside the Capitol, all kinds of angles were captured, uh, has actually been shown. So we're going to see things that we haven't seen before. Also, many of the uh, committee's depositions were videotaped, and we are reportedly going to be seeing clips from that. So that is going to be an interesting moment. Of course, we have this uh, pivotal moment of the war in Ukraine where uh, there are some people who believe that the uh, the tide has turned. We are sending more weapons out there, but we have the French president suggesting that, you know, by all means, let's not humiliate Vladimir Putin. Let's not make him mad because then he might do something. I'm not sure how, how, how you finish that sentence. Janet Yellen is admitting that, yeah, she got the inflation wrong, which is interesting uh, to hear. We had a very interesting uh, Washington Post uh, deep dive. What's the opposite of bromance, Will Salatin? What, what is the opposite of bromance? The, the breakup between Joe Biden and Joe Manchin. Yeah. What do you, no, what do you call that? The bro break? I just, <laughs> it's, uh, a bro, it's a broke up. It is. It is a, a mess. And tomorrow in San Francisco, and I'm, I'm sorry for those of you who are fragile about these sorts of things, but uh, progressives are going to take it on the chin. Actually, that's understating it. I, I think there's going to be a, a shellacking tomorrow uh, in the recall election in San Francisco where the uh, very, very progressive DA, Chesa Boudin. Well, we'll talk about Chesa Boudin quite a bit over the next couple of weeks because uh, he's about to be kicked out on his ass <laughs> by very, very liberal San Francisco voters who discovered, well, maybe we're not as liberal as that guy. So uh, there's all of this going on, which means... On our Monday podcast, we have to talk about the Queen's uh, Jubilee celebrations, which were awesome. <laughs> what was the most awesome thing about the Queen's celebration, do you think, Will? I, 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 I don't know. I mean, the, I, I didn't focus on the celebrations. Just the fact that this lady has been around for 70 years and Amazing. doing the very important public service of keeping Prince Charles off the throne. That's absolutely crucial. She's done an excellent job. Well, that will, that will be temporary. So I, I had a, I had a lot of serious takes and, and much less serious takes. Uh, I'm, I'm going to hold my less serious. I'm going to hold my really serious takes about the future of the monarchy and everything. You know, for some other time. What fascinated me was how spectacular the show was. The use of the lighted drones to make <laughs> pictures in the sky, doing a video with the Queen and Paddington Bear. Um, having Queen perform, uh, you know, it, the big question I have is who in the royal family or in Buckingham Palace, that stuffy group of gray men decided to green light all this cool stuff? I, you know <laughs> what I'm saying? It's like somebody went and said, hey, we could have drones do this and we could have this amazing light show and we could do all this. And you'd figure that somebody would go, no, this is the Queen. We need to make <laughs> no, we can't do that. That would be too much. And somebody said, fuck it. This is like 70 years. It's never happened before. It's never going to happen again. Let's just pull out everything. And they did. And it was amazing. Maybe it's the last twitch of the monarchy. Maybe this is going to be enough to keep the monarchy going for a few more decades. I don't know. But it was pretty amazing, I thought. Don't you think that there was some awesome, there were some meetings where the monarchy consultants came in and said, oh, look, yeah. we, we've got to make this age old institution relevant to oh, yeah. quote the, the young people and, you know, just went nuts on all of the electronics and all of the special effects. Yeah, but somebody had to say, yes, let's do all that stuff. And that that's what really strikes me as interesting. And and I know apparently you have a, like a, a thing for, for Prince Charles. I have to think that he was the guy that gave the thumbs up. I mean, he's basically running the show these days. And he said, yeah, let's do it. I don't know who else would have that kind of clout. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think Charles is too old to have said yes to this. So I'm, uh, I'm wondering if he, if he delegated it. You know, old people can be creative. It's a... Uh, so, um, because I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, he said about to go down the rabbit hole. 
I have to really wonder what was going through Megan and Harry's mind during all of this, because, you know, they have decided they'd rather be L.A. celebrities than working royals. And they had to be looking at this and going, you know, this is the real deal. I mean, this is like you want to talk about that. Look, celebrities are a dime a dozen. They're 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 temporary. And and they they sort of opted for that. And but they had to look, look at this and go, OK, this is like the real thing that endures and we're not part of it. There must have been like a thousand humiliations. Like, here's the royal family gets to do this and not you two. You quit. Remember? <laughs> so yeah, you I, don't get to be on the balcony. I and don't know. It's, I, like, it, it's exactly the kind of thing Megan would have greenlighted. So I don't uh, I, it, somewhere mm. along the line, some young people got involved in this. But, you know, I, I don't know, Charlie, I wouldn't be too confident about the the, the this being the lasting thing. I, I think that this is a reach for relevance. It, it oh, yeah. may work. They may be able to keep it around, but I'm not sure I would bet on the monarchy. No, no, I, I think maybe maybe it was a last spasm of the monarchy, but it was a hell of a one. I mean, it's almost as if they said, OK, we need to do something like an Olympic opening or something. And then let's like dial it up a bit. You know, you right. know what I mean? <laughs> it's just, so anyway, for those of you who are hoping you were going to devote the entire podcast to the Queen's Jubilee. On the other hand, I'm, I'm guessing that uh, you're probably going to be getting off this podcast and going and uh, rewatching, binge watching The Crown. <laughs> I, you, you just you just won't admit it yeah no i'll i'll do that but first i'm gonna like you know re revisit all of the olympic ceremonies because I, the the comparison's interesting like the monarchy has an extremely bad rap right the monarchy is you know the the evils of uh, Busty, of, uh right. Of, right but 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 you know w what could be worse than the chinese government <laughs> running a sort of a similarly extravagant affair and meanwhile like uh, ongoing human rights abuses so by comparison the royals look pretty good they had the celebration minus the human rights abuses so you understand that i'm kind of filibustering here because it's monday morning and i'm trying to delay talking about um mass shootings um the assassination of a retired wisconsin <laughs> judge I'm sorry, I just, it, the news is just so bad sometimes. It's overwhelming what's going on in Ukraine. And of course, uh, President Biden deciding that despite all of his, and, and I'm going to attribute, you know, his better instinct, despite all of his better instincts that he's going to uh, Saudi Arabia uh, to kiss the ring of, uh, of MBS, which is, I don't know, I find that to be kind of a depressing story. But what's, mm -hmm. what's, what's your take here? Well, I think, Charlie, it's the return of the sort of bipolar world. Um, yeah, and real bipolar. politique. Yes, you're right. I'm sorry. Bipolar now has come to mean mental health. But you know, no. back in the day of like anti-communism, right? The Soviet Union was this all-powerful. It was, it had yeah, built. An enemy. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And and so everything was seen through that lens. And we, you know, as, you know, Gene Kirkpatrick and, and, other, and others sort of in that day, anti-communist American leaders formed alliances with people who were unsavory or gross or just vile because, you know, they could be turned against, they could be part of an alliance against the Soviet Union. And now, you know, that that Russian empire has reemerged through Vladimir Putin, not the Soviet Union, but a Russian. It's it, what we've done is we've got, we've gone to the Venezuelans, right? <laughs> who who are yeah. awful. We've gone to the Saudis, the MBS, who was awful. And we're just like, look, can you produce oil for us? Can you, you know, can you do something to help us cut Vladimir Putin out of the international economy? And if the answer is yes, if, you can, if we can get some kind of a deal from them, then we're willing to look the other way to, uh, on the fact that you have murdered an American resident and done various other crimes. Yeah, we, we're constantly revising our standards of uh, moral opprobrium and uh you know, who gets to be a pariah. And, and look, we you go, you go back to World War II, actually much, much further than that, but World War II, where we decided we were going to ally ourselves with uh, with Joseph Stalin in order to beat Adolf Hitler. So this is not new. But it is interesting hearing the reaction of uh, Democrats uh, to this. And uh, here's Adam Schiff uh, from yesterday, Adam Schiff on one of the Sunday shows, uh, specifically addressing Biden's decision to go to Saudi Arabia. Let's play that. Should the president still go to Saudi Arabia and meet with the crown prince? Uh, in my view, no. Uh, I wouldn't go. I wouldn't shake his hand. This is someone who butchered an American resident, uh, cut him up into pieces in the, in the most uh, terrible and premeditated way. Uh, and until uh, Saudi Arabia makes a, a radical change in terms of its human rights, uh, I wouldn't want anything to do with him. Uh, now, I understand the, the, the degree to which uh, Saudi Arabia controls oil prices. 
I think that's a compelling argument for us to wean ourselves off of reliance on foreign oil and on oil uh, uh, more globally. Uh, so we don't have uh, despots and murderers uh, calling the shots. Uh, but no, I wouldn't go. And, uh, and if, if I had to go to the country for some other reason, I wouldn't meet with the crown prince. Uh, I think he should be shunned. So there is no way to justify a trip like this if it is an attempt to get Saudi Arabia to put more oil on the market and lower gas prices? Well, in my view, uh, we should make every effort uh, to lo lower oil prices, uh, but uh, going hat in hand uh, to uh, someone who's murdered an American resident uh, would not be on my list. Uh, and I would want to see Saudi Arabia lower uh, their oil prices or increase their production, rather. Uh, I'd want to see them make changes in their human rights record. I want to see them hold uh, people accountable uh, that were involved in that murder uh, right. and in the torture of other detainees before uh, I would uh, extend that kind of um, mm -hmm. uh, dignity uh, to Saudi Arabia or its leadership. So here's what Jonathan Lemire writes in Politico. For nearly a month, Biden and his inner circle have agonized over whether to make a trip to Saudi Arabia. A nation the president deemed a pariah after its crown prince, uh, MBS, ordered the murder and dismemberment of Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi. Biden, for a time, angrily rejected meeting with the crown prince, arguing the presidency, quote, should stand for something, unquote, according to two people with knowledge of his thinking. But he has recently relented, recognizing a need to push Riyadh for Riyadh for more oil production still. The dates for the trip remain fluid, leaving some aides to wonder if the president will change his mind again. I guess my my initial reaction was, okay, I, I understand uh, real politic. Uh, I understand that virtually everyone has engaged in this and that maybe you do need to make these trades. On the other hand, this seemed like a signal of weakness at a bad moment, which is that I am so desperate uh, to do something about these gas prices, that I am willing to do something that even I, Joe Biden, recognize is really morally uh, repulsive. Okay, but is it is he doing it to just lower gas prices for himself politically, <clears throat> or is he doing it to cut Vladimir Putin out of the international oil market? Okay. I, I think it's the latter, and I okay. think it's worth defending. So I will defend the real politic. I think, Charlie, that we have been extremely spoiled to be living in a period after the last world war, before this one, um, uh, which hopefully will not be a world war, but it's a, it's a land war in Europe. It's a huge deal, right? Um, and we've ha not had to make these kinds of compromises. And we've been living in a period where everyone is very morally aware and we're, you know, I mean, look, what happened to Jamal Khashoggi? Terrible. MBS, absolutely complicit, right? He's an awful person. That's part of how he got to, you know, be in charge of Saudi Arabia. But these people are all over the place. This was true of the Venezuelans too. I think we're spoiled. I think it's really easy for Adam Schiff to go off on this because he's in the House of Representatives. You're no one is easier. It's it's easier for members of Congress to go off. They don't have the responsibility that the president has. And I think Biden's in a difficult position. And I think that he is making a, a, a decision that he has to make because the most important thing right now is not the Saudis. It is not Jamal Khashoggi. It is the, the ongoing murder of so many Ukrainians, the threat to Europe. And it is that we must make sure that Putin pays a very high price for this invasion, including being a pariah, including being cut out of the international economy, in part so that President Xi of China does not follow suit and do the same thing okay. to Taiwan. Okay, I do not disagree with you. On the other hand, I got to tell you that I'm haunted by the fact that that logic is absolutely parallel to the rationalization that Donald Trump used when he was explaining why he was sucking up to Putin. And remember, Bill O'Reilly said to him, well, you know, Putin's a killer. And, um, and Trump said, well, there are lots of killers. We've killed lots of people. Um, the same, basically the same sort of logic. Now, of course, the world has changed. The circumstances have changed. Our metrics of evil have changed, but there's always a way to justify re-embracing the monsters of the world because there's always a bigger monster. So I don't disagree with you, but I, I, I guess I, I reserve the right to be queasy about it. Yeah, but Charlie, what was the bigger monster in Trump's case? Right. Back, you know, yeah. 10, 15 years ago, we were like, well, the Russians are our allies against the Islamic terrorists, right? And there was a major concern about that. But I think Putin has pretty well demonstrated that he's a bigger threat than those terrorists, um, at least. Well, at, I agree, at, yeah. 
Yeah. So I, I don't see it. Can, can I say one other thing about what yeah. Adam Schiff did? Um, I fundamentally agree with Adam Schiff, and I think Republicans need to understand this. When he says we need to wean ourselves off oil, that is not just some sort of woke, crunchy thing that the left does. That is a national security thing, right? Russia is, its entire economy, what, 50% of their revenue, I think, is based on oil? And, and they're, they're we, a gas station with nukes, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So it is crucial for the whole world to move away from fossil fuels, to no longer be dependent in part so they won't be dependent on Putin. Um, OK, let's take a deep breath here uh, because I want to talk about uh, the prospects for a gun deal, which comes after another weekend of more mass shootings. And there are the there there are some some green shoots. Uh, there is are the suggestions from uh, senators like Chris Murphy, who is one of the grown ups in the Senate, uh, that maybe there is a deal in the offing. Uh, I am skeptical, but I want to get your take, Will. But let's do that right after this. It's here. This could be the most important moment of your financial life because many experts are predicting a recession bigger than 2008 that may be coming, which means you could lose more than 20% of your wealth in a snap. So how are professional investors preparing for this economic cataclysm? Well, that's a trick question because they already have. They've secured their wealth with what some call history's most dependable investment. And I'm talking about fine art. In other words, paintings by legends like Picasso, Warhol, and Banksy. And thanks to a game-changing company called Masterworks. Why is this so amazing? Why should you be interested in this? Well, because you can finally get in for a fraction of the price and still reap the benefits. They've handed investors over 30% returns three times now. If you're serious about building wealth, don't wait. And now you can get priority access by using this special referral link. It's masterworks.com promo code Bulwark. That's masterworks.com promo code Bulwark. Before deciding to invest, carefully review important disclosures at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. Okay, we are back with Will Salatin. You want to talk about guns? Sure, let's talk about guns. I almost never want to talk about guns, but I think we have to because there is this moment. And look, I, I want to think that maybe this is the moment for a little bit of common sense because the, the proposals on the table now are so modest, raising the age, which seems to be almost universally accepted, universal background checks supported by 80, 90 percent of Americans, you know, maybe limiting the size of, of magazines, red flag laws. So what do you think? Um, is is this time different, which is, by the way, what we've asked after every other mass shooting? Is it, but is this time actually different, do you think? Well, the people in the room think it's different. That is Chris Murphy, Pat Toomey, you know, senators who have worked on this for a long time and have, who, who, you know, couldn't couldn't get their stuff, their bills passed after Sandy Hook. Yeah. They believe that now there is enough momentum to get this done. And it, yes, you're right. Absolutely, Charlie. It is modest, but it is important. And and, you know, what Toomey said on one of the shows this weekend was he's not going for like just to get 10 Republicans, not just to bust the filibuster. He's looking he's looking to get half the Republican conference. And, yeah, the price awesome. of that is some some things won't be in it, but there will be a statement that there is a broad consensus for some reasonable regulation. And and the the, the point I would make about what they're doing, OK, it's modest, but stuff like, you know, background checks, the red flag laws, the raising the age. It's very hard for a lot of conservatives to justify to themselves or to their voters um, restrictions on guns. But of restrictions, any kind. right? But like, so we're not going to ban AR-15s, right? Much as I would like to ban them. Um, but they're willing to entertain. And the polling, there was an interesting CBS poll this weekend that shows, in, including among the Republican base, the polling shows a lot of willingness to restrict who can get the guns, right? So the that's what that's where the background checks come in. That's where the red flag laws come in. That's where the age restrictions come in. And I'm very interested to see how far we can carry that model of like, you have to get licensed or you have to get a background check, or if you do something, you know, a criminal thing or some mental health red flag, your guns are temporarily taken away. How far can we push that model in terms of separating the guns, which are out there from the people who are too dangerous to have access to them? So do you think something will get done? Yes, I absolutely think something will get done. I think it will be along these lines, and I think a lot of folks will be very unhappy that it isn't more. But if we do nothing, the sense of despair will just be unbelievable. Well, but we've been here before, and I think that's that's the 
you know, and, 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 that, and that's the source of my skepticism and uh, some would say cynicism about all of this, because I've seen this just too many times. Uh, I thought it was absolutely inconceivable that we wouldn't get something done after Sandy Hook, and yet we didn't. So uh, the, 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 the fundamentals of American politics have not changed, including the demagoguery. On the other hand, there are some indications here. Sarah Longwell, our colleague, tweeted out that she had just done a focus group of, uh, of uh, Republican voters. I think it was in Florida, and everybody there was they had no problem with raising the age to 21 for buying an, an AR-15. That's good. Uh, a Republican governor of West Virginia, uh, Justice, uh, also said he has no problem with with all of that. I noticed some of the, the Bigfoot donors in Texas signing a letter saying that we need to you know, make some some reform. So maybe there's a shift. On the other hand, oh, and also there's, there's kind of a split in the gun lobby between the NRA and I think the, uh, the Sportsman's Federation, which has generally been very very much aligned with them on on these questions. But I guess if something has happened uh, over and over and over in the past or something has failed to happen over and over and over in the past, I think the I guess my default setting is to assume that that's that's not going to change. But I once again hope that you are right about this. OK, so what do you want to talk about next? What should we do next? I, can, I wanted to say one more thing about guns. Oh, sure. OK. So I wouldn't be too despairing of something happening here. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is I just watched what happened in in Europe with, you know, Putin. And and w there had been decades and decades of the Europeans not taking the Russians seriously as a threat. And when when the invasion of Ukraine happened, suddenly we have things like, you know, the the Finns and the Swedes joining NATO, uh, the Germans trying to sort of realign their economy to not depend on Russia. So in other words, a big thing can happen, a thing where nothing has changed, so a, a thing can be big, an event happens that is so big that it moves public opinion and it changes policy. And I believe at some point there will be a gun crime big enough to do that um, or an accumulation of them. We've had like now we've had two uh, where 20 children have been murdered in a school, you know, 30 kids, 40 kids, 100. At some point, there is going to be a disaster, I believe, big enough to move public opinion to take guns more seriously as a threat in America and to do something about it. Oh, you sweet summer child. I, 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 I hope that this optimism is justified. I really, really do. I just you know I'm just looking at the list of, of horrors that have happened in the past and note that the, the, the right has become even more absolutist in, in their position. But again, I, I, I seriously hope that you're right. And I think that they do. You know, I find myself being more and more radicalized on this issue because, uh, look, I'm not running for governor of, of Texas, um, so I can say that I think that we ought to have a, a ban on AR-15s um, because but I don't have to I don't have to run for office. Um, but I also understand that's not going to happen. But yeah, again, we, we'll we'll find out relatively uh, soon on this. OK, so you, you get to choose. What do you want to talk about uh, next? You want to talk about Ukraine? You want to talk about um you want to talk about inflation? You want to talk about the January 6th committee? Because you've got stuff on the January 6th committee, which is going to be... Um, all of the above, all of the above. The thing about the assassination of the uh, former oh, judge in yeah. Wisconsin is, is uh, that, that uh, in part because that's adjacent to the conversation we were just it having is. about guns. Um, this is like, this is, uh, this is a point I desperately want to make to uh, people on the right, people who believe devoutly in the right to own firearms and believe that it's in the constitution and that's, you know, we, we can't do anything about it, to the absolutist. You will lose your liberty to some extent, one way or another. If you do not allow any restrictions on firearms or on access to firearms, we will, we will live in this kind of society where people are always afraid, where people literally cannot go places because they're afraid, where children are afraid to go to school, um, or where in order to protect ourselves, we will have to have so many checkpoints downstream of the acquisition of the weapon. In other words, because there are so many guns floating around and we've decided, you know, it's just too much of a restriction on someone's civil liberties to have to wait three days for a background check, or if the background check takes longer than that, just let them have the gun because we should err on the side of, quote, freedom. At that point, you have so many people wandering around with these guns, murdering judges, murdering school children, that we are gonna have to have, you know, one door only in every school, that kind of craziness armed guards everywhere, metal detectors everywhere. People will just not go go places because they're afraid to be in a stadium. What happens if someone has a gun there? And we have to decide whether we're going to live that way or whether we're going to 
put reasonable restrictions on access to firearms so we can live a normal life. Well, I agree with you completely there. And I, this will be the darkest moment in the podcast uh, because um, I agree with you completely about all of this. So this is, you know, th this may, you know, you may, you may be tempted to say this is a random act. I, I think it's a, uh, it's just another uh, warning sign uh, for people who are not aware of what we're talking about. Uh, there is a, this uh, a retired judge was was murdered in his home by someone that he had sentenced to, uh, to to prison back in 2005. And the suspect also had a list of other targets, potential targets, including Governor Tony Evers, a Democrat, uh, the Michigan governor, Gretchen Whitmer, who apparently is just an obsession of these people, uh, also a Democrat. And interestingly enough, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, David Graham in The Atlantic makes a point that's been hovering in the back of my mind for a long time that maybe the United States has only gotten lucky that there haven't been more assassinations already. Security around presidents, other politicians, much tighter than it was in the 1960s, but that hasn't stopped people from trying to kill politicians. Uh, 2017, a domestic terrorist fueled by hatred for Republicans shot and injured four people, including the House Majority Whip Steve Scalise. People forget about this. In 2008, Caesar Sayoc, Trump superfan, mailed pipe bombs to a variety of people he'd identified as Trump enemies. Uh, 2020, a disgruntled lawyer uh, fueled by racism and sexism tried to kill a federal judge in New Jersey, killing her son instead. Later in 2020, several men were arrested for plotting to kill uh, Gretchen Whitmer. And then, of course, January 6th, 2021, a mob storms the Capitol declaring they wanted to kill House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Vice President Mike Pence. So we keep talking about violence and talking about violence. And, and yet we're all going to be shocked when there is an act of political violence, a kind of act of political violence that we used to almost assume was routine back in the 1960s. And I think that that's real. So th this seems like a good segue to talk about uh, the January 6th committee. Sure and what we can expect from, from that. So let's, let's dive into the first of the televised hearings, uh, which will be later this week. Let's dive into that right after this. I hope you all had a great Memorial Day weekend. I know that I did. Uh, we had uh, family and friends uh, out to the Lake Cottage. And of course, because this is Wisconsin, we fire up the grill. And because I had a package from Omaha Steaks, we were able to have a great time. I have to tell you how much everybody enjoyed the entire selection. So here's a little bit of gift-giving wisdom from Omaha Steaks. Dads want steaks. And with Father's Day just around the corner, there's not a better gift than Omaha Steaks, trust me. Visit omahasteaks.com, type Bulwark in the search bar, and order the Dads Want Steaks package. For just $99, this limited time package includes 16 mouth-watering entrees that he's guaranteed to love, like smoky, tender, bacon-wrapped filet mignon, gourmet jumbo franks, and their air-chilled boneless chicken breasts. And for a sweet finish, delicious caramel apple tartlets. I, I Look, I'm getting hungry just thinking about them, and I have to say that these were a big hit over the last weekend, and you cannot beat the price. And as a special gift for my listeners, when you type Bulwark in the search bar and order the Dad's Want Steaks package, you'll also get eight, eight free Omaha Steaks burgers. These burgers are full of bold, beefy flavor made from 100% Omaha Steaks, and now they're bigger than ever at a whopping six ounces. Look, don't wait. Send Dad more than just one gift. Send him an experience he's just going to love and he can share with you. So go to omahasteaks.com and type Bulwark into the search bar. Order the Dad's Want Steaks package. You'll get 16 entrees, four desserts, plus eight free Omaha Steaks burgers. Omaha Steaks isn't just steak. It's the best steak of your life, guaranteed. That's omahasteaks.com, keyword bulwark. Okay, we are back, a will. January 6th committee, about to have its moment in the sun. I, I, in my newsletter today, I said, look, I think two things are true at the same time. Number one, they may not make a big difference to voters. I don't think they're going to change the trajectory of the midterms. Democrats should keep their expectations in check. On the other hand, for some reason, Trump and uh, the uh, Trumpian GOP are acting like they're worried about this because they are mobilizing this massive counter spin. So clearly, they at least see that putting Donald Trump's criminal behavior on trial might be, well, shall we say, problematic. What do you think? 
Yeah, no, it will be. But you know, and I think honestly, Charlie, Trump is more triggered by the fact that this is on primetime TV than anything else. Remember, Trump exactly. is like he, he's right. a TV guy. He he doesn't actually believe in anything, but he's concerned about PR and what's exactly. you know, the guy who watches Fox News to get his uh, to get uh, his policy advice instead of listening to the people who are in the White House telling him stuff. So it's all about TV to him, and the fact that it's on TV will piss him off. But I will say this about Trump. I think part of what's going to come out of these hearings is that as awful as Trump's behavior was on January 6th, um, it was really fundamentally the behavior of ignoring the attack or cheering it on. Um, not so much the incitement, because a lot of what's going to be illuminated in these hearings is the extent to which other people had already prepared violence for January 6th, the, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, whatnot, all these, and and people who are connected to like Roger Stone and other people around Trump in various ways. But it's not, Trump wasn't central to that, right? So there's the story of Trump and John Eastman and others conspiring to try to overturn the election on January 6th. And then there's the planning for the violence. And there will be some divergence in storyline, which will weirdly make this a little bit less about Trump. But the part that's about Trump is once the violence began, he was plainly happy about it. We now have revelations that, you know, he was he, he was unhappy that Mike Pence was being whisked away, that he thought that maybe Pence should be hanged. Uh, and that will be absolutely damning. But that will not be the incitement part of the story. I don't see. I think that the, that this these hearings will be all about Trump. They will be all about his his uh, possible criminal behavior, and not just about the, what he did or said on January sixth, but the entire run up to it. This vast conspiracy to use the uh, levers of the federal government uh, to overturn the election. Uh, that the the big lie uh, is traced back to Donald Trump's refusal to concede, and 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 so all of these dots that need to be connected. None None of this would have happened without the predicate of Donald Trump refusing to concede, Donald Trump demanding, um, you know, that people, you know, find a way for him to win. So I, I, I think it's going to be and it ought to be it ought to be very, very Trump Trump centric. Um, and so, I, again, I, I, I have low expectations about what this will do for public opinion, but I have high expectations that they're going to make a compelling case. Um, and I think that, they, that you put your finger on why they're they're worried about the TV show and the fact that they've hired this guy from uh, from ABC and his name is uh, apparently James Goldston, former president of ABC News, master documentary storyteller, ran Good Morning America and Nightline, and they're treating this in exactly the way that Donald Trump would least like <laughs> to put it that way that it, it's going to be a very very compelling story, but it all has to come back to connect the dots demonstrate why this matters, hold the bad actors accountable, and frankly, whether or not this saves Democrats, which I don't think that it will, it's necessary. Yeah. Because this poll principle is anyone above the law. I mean, one of the, the comforting lies we keep telling ourselves is that no one's above the law, which I think we find out on a weekly basis is bullshit. You know, Donald Trump has been above the law. I think Elon Musk is, uh, is is above the law when it comes to the SEC. And I think that that's going to be one of the, the themes that's going to hang over the entire hearing. No, I agree with you. The above the law part of this, Charlie, is so important because so we now have the, the Justice Department's not going to prosecute apparently uh, Mark, Mark Meadows yeah. and Dan Scavino, um, who are contempt of Congress. But it, this try, try to imagine for a minute, try to imagine what Republicans in Congress would be saying if instead of declining to prosecute Meadows and Scavino and, and some others involved in, in January 6th, they were, you know, that a, a bunch of Black Lives Matter protesters who would like, you know, like a, torched a police precinct or, you know, or uh, honestly, any sort of random minority person who has committed a street crime. Imagine the how incensed you, you would hear on Fox News about that story. But because it is these nice white men, I'm sorry, I don't want to racialize everything, but because it is these nice, well-connected white men in suits who are, uh, who are violating the law uh, and who are now being spared prosecution, right, who are getting off, and that may end up including Donald Trump, suddenly Republicans don't care about the rule of law. They are so selective in, this in the application of their stated principle of law and order. That is for those other people. Our people are above the law.
Well, it's so deeply unfair, as Louis Gohmert said last week. Look, I, I, I think maybe a year ago it was a slam dunk that Louis Gohmert was the dumbest member of Congress. I think there's just a lot of competition. And uh, next year, there's going to be a lot more competition for this. But did you hear what uh, Louis Gohmert had to say? I think it was on, on, on Newsmax where he's complaining about the deep unfairness about all of this. Let's play that. Louis Gohmert. Trump administration yeah, officials John, for their failure to it, comport it, with this political committee. Yep. It, it actually puts an exclamation point on the fact that we have a two-tier justice system. Uh, if you're a Republican, you can't even lie to Congress no. or lie to an FBI agent or they're coming after you. They're going to bury you. They're going to put you in the D.C. jail and terrorize and torture you and not live up to the Constitution there. You. Will, what's it's interesting there is Louis Gohmert's right that, hey, you can't even lie to Congress. We can't even lie to the FBI and, th and they'll come after you. It's like, uh, Louis, no one can lie to the FBI. <laughs> you know, uh, and, OK, so, Charlie, this drives home one of my favorite theses about these, these right wingers. They are liberals. They are liberals when it comes to people like them. Right. When it comes to people like them. Oh, those are our those are our uh, violent pro uh, protesters. Those are, you know, the January 6 people. They're nice white folks like us. They're from, you know, our part of the country. They believe what we believe. They're political prisoners. You know, you can all rot in hell. People, you know, minority people from some other city who convicted of some other crime, you know, throw the book at them, right? We're tough on crime, but our people are political prisoners. And, you know, it, the, then this goes right back to the guns thing where it's like- and law And uh, law enforcement are jackbooted yeah. thugs. Yeah, yeah, why did Dylan? We, we, why could yeah, Dylan yeah. Roof get his gun? Right. Well, because you know, if they can't complete the background check in three days, well, you must let them have the gun because these are presumed to be law-abiding citizens. Uh, so they're uh, liberal uh, about all of these things when it's their people. So um, on on the January sixth uh, committee hearings, it's cl pretty clear that uh, Liz Cheney is playing an outsized role in really pushing the committee to be as aggressive as possible. And she was on CBS uh, News yesterday morning talking with, uh, with with Bob Costa. Let's play a little bit of what uh, what Liz Cheney had to say. You know, in my state, the the state party chairman is a member of the Oath Keepers. He was he was here on January 6th. Great. Uh, he was here with a walkie talkie in his hand on January 6th. That is a, a mortal threat and it is a moral test. We, we can't fail that moral test, but there are too many right now in my party um, who are failing it. Yeah, um, she puts that in very, very stark terms. This is a moral test, and there are too many members of the Republican Party, obviously, including uh, the Republicans uh, back in Wyoming who are working so hard to throw her out of Congress, who are failing this moral test. Yeah, and it's not just about the past, Charlie. It's about the present, as she points out, Very the state party so. chairman. So that guy, he's at January 6th. He's involved in this. He is now the state party chairman. He's heavily involved. In, that's central to Liz Cheney being, I forget what the Wyoming Republican Party said. They, they censured her or they just endorsed her opponent. I can't remember. But anyway, the point is the party apparatus turned against her. The party apparatus is this guy who is literally a January 6th participant. And I believe, Charlie, you can correct me, but when Trump came to Wyoming a week ago, you know, it was like a take down Liz Cheney rally. And part of it was naming this guy as like one of his buds. So these people, <laughs> these January 6th people have infested the Republican Party. Donald Trump could die tomorrow. These people are still out there. And what Liz Cheney is pointing out is they are running the party. They are censuring and booting out people like her. Um, this is an imminent ongoing threat. Yes. And it, it infested the party, infected the party. We'll have to work on the analogy there because uh, but that's absolutely true. And of course, uh, the leader of the congressional wing of the party, well, at least the, the House uh, version, is uh, the speaker in waiting, Kevin McCarthy. Did you see the story in Politico where, where somebody wrote, like, everyone knows that Kevin McCarthy's kind of stupid, he's kind of dumb, but nobody wants to write that, that he's basically, but whatever. But Kevin McCarthy, 
it, it, at least he adds a little bit to uh, the, the the data points every time he opens his mouth. He was on uh, one of the Sunday shows yesterday. Uh, let, let's play a little bit of uh, Kevin McCarthy. My opinion of the committee has not changed because remember what this committee is. Remember what the purpose is. First, Nancy Pelosi has broken 232-year history of the House by not allowing the minority to appoint anyone to the committee. Uh. This committee does not have 13 members as the power of the House voted for it to have. But what's even worse about this committee is it's beyond its legislative scope. You know, there are separations of powers. The House does not have criminal investigation, but what they're doing in this committee is going after their political foes, their opponents. We've watched it time and again. Their role should be why, is, why was the Capitol so ill-prepared that day? What do we have to do in the future to make sure it's oh, not? God. The Senate had a bipartisan committee look at it, and that's exactly what they looked at, the legislative rule of the House. But what we have found with one-party rule of Democrats taking over the House, the Senate, and the presidency, they used the power to go after their political opponents instead of bringing down gasoline prices. <laughs> Okay, so you had all the talking points there. So that Kevin McCarthy's ongoing leading the the charge to cover up what happened in January 6th, it's, it's like it doesn't even register with him at this point. No, no. Okay, so first of all, he's lying. He yeah, McCarthy yes. is lying about what Shock. Nancy Pelosi. She Shock. did not say she did not prevent the minority from appointing people. Right? He appointed his people to the committee. She vetoed two of them. One of whom was directly involved in January six stuff. Another of whom had already said the committee was illegitimate. She reasonably said, "Not those two. Get, we'll take the other three. Give us two more." And he said no. And he pulled all of his people out. And so he's now telling a lie so that he can make it look like the committee is illegitimate when he's Correct. the one who made that decision. Secondly, when McCarthy goes off about how the hearings shouldn't be about the plotting of January 6th, the perpetration of January 6th, they should be about how, as he put it, how the Capitol was ill-prepared. Oh. When, when he said, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it is true that there yeah. were some failures of preparation, mm -hmm. but what he is doing is saying, don't talk about the perpetrators. Don't talk about the criminals. Let's blame the cops, right? That's exactly what he's saying. Why weren't the cops better prepared? Why wasn't law enforcement? And again, imagine if this were like a Black Lives Matter protest. Imagine Republicans saying, you know, it's not the fault of the perpetrators. We should ask why the cops weren't better prepared to deal with these protests. They would never do that because the Black Lives Matter protesters aren't their people, the Republican people, but the January 6th people are. Well, yes, I agree with all of that. Uh, but I, I also found it uh, highly ironic that, you know, his, his faux indignation about the Democrats are using their power to go after their political opponents. Actually, they're going after the people who are involved in the attempt to overthrow a free and fair election. They're going after the people who tried to, uh, uh, you know, attack the Capitol, but whatever. What's interesting about that is, is once again, you see this projection because you know that when Republicans take over Congress, that is exactly what they're going to do. That the agenda of the Trumpian restoration is all about the revenge tour. It's all about the desire to use the power of Congress, of the presidency, of the Trumpified uh, Justice Department to go after political foes. And they will do this with a vengeance. We will look back on this as a kinder, gentler, sort of milk toast era when we see what Republicans are prepared to do. My only question is whether or not um, a Republican House will impeach Joe Biden twice or just once um, over the next two years. So all of this posing for holy pictures, like imagine a partisan majority using its power to go after, fuck you, Kevin, you know exactly <laughs> what you're going to do. I mean, this will be, they will do no serious legislation at all. It will be this vendetta tour from morning until night, from dawn until dusk, 24 seven, the investigations and the multiple impeachments. And by the way, don't think that just impeaching Biden will be enough. If Marjorie Taylor Greene wants to impeach Kamala Harris, if she wants to impeach uh, Merrick Garland, they're going to do it. They will, there will be efforts to do all of that stuff. You think that I'm paranoid, but I was the guy in the middle of 2016 who was saying, and people were like shocked when I said, you know, number one, Trump is not ever going to concede this election. And number two, you know that he's eligible to run in 2024. He could come back. <gasps> So there's my there is there's my prediction for there's my prediction for the moment.
Oh, there's, there's plenty of evidence for your for your argument, yeah. right? We, we it, it took it took from about uh, let's see, Trump was acquitted in the second impeachment in what February of 2021, yeah. and then by August, Biden has pulled out of Afghanistan, and the same Republicans in Congress who said impeachment should almost never be used, very high bar, were claiming that because they were unhappy with the manner in which we pulled out of Afghanistan, Joe Biden should be impeached. Okay, so I, I am a big fan of the January 6th committee. I've made no secret of that. I, I think that they have exceeded expectations. I am constantly surprised about how well they've done. There's one discordant note, but I want to get your take on all of this. There are reports that uh, Jamie Raskin is one of the senior members of the committee, and you know somebody who's done very well with the impeachment of Donald Trump is reportedly pushing the committee to call for the abolition of the Electoral College. I have to tell you, that strikes me as no, you know, stick stick to the knitting here. I mean, that it's uh, that's off message. That's going too far. That seems like a distraction. What do you think? No, I agree with you. Yeah. You need a very broad coalition here to defend yeah. democracy. Focus, and focus, truth. focus. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so you want you want to narrow the agenda, and it's not a small agenda, right? Protecting elections from people who want to revise them afterwards to change the votes. That's absolutely crucial to the continuation of our republic. If I'm a Republican, if I'm a Trumpist, my favorite thing is Raskin or anyone else trying to broaden this in, totally into agree. a partisan war where I can get more Republicans, people who are antsy about leftists trying to change the political process on my side. Okay, so I want to have asterisks all around this because every once in a while I recommend television shows to people for binge watching. And, and by the way, one of the shows that I highly recommend is Annika. Um, which is, uh, which is really, really good. It's, it, you know, police procedural, but, but very, 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 very quirky with Nicola Walker. I just, I just suggesting this is a great show. However, there's, I, I, you know, I shouldn't even do this because most people can't take it. I mean, I, I understand that it's over the top and it's, if you do not like something that is grisly, that is violent, that is very graphic, do not watch this show. Okay. I just want to make this very clear. The new epi the new season of the boys. You watch that stuff, right? I, I haven't, but now I'm I'm waiting with bated breath. Go ahead. Oh, they I will just say that it is it has a very strong, not terribly subtle political overlay. And I would love to discuss it, but I, I would don't I have a spoiler alert, except to say that there are certain moments that will resonate with anyone who's been paying attention to the news lately. But do not watch this with children. Do not watch this with somebody who is squeamish. Do not email me that you are outraged that I suggested this. But in terms of the power of television and how everything is decided by ratings, not whether somebody is you know right or wrong or good or evil, it's what your Q rating is and, and what the public is willing to accept. It's and the gap between the reality and, and, and the marketing world out there. It, it's it's. I, shockingly well done, but again, way over the top. Don't walk into it with any illusions whatsoever. Okay. So Janet Yellen admits she like screwed up on inflation. <clears throat> Will. Yeah. Oh, Ouch. I, God bless her. God bless her. <laughs> and can we please canonize Janet Yellen? And can everyone just please? Uh... No. <laughs> so you don't want to canonize somebody who's screwed up. She actually has a really good record. She has a really good record of being right. In this case, she was wrong. Janet Yellen admitted she was wrong about inflation. She underestimated inflation. She thought it was more transitory than it was. Uh, and but you know, instead of doing the usual Washington bullshit and like refusing to admit you were, and then changing the subject and talking about how you were basically right, you know, truthiness and all that, she just outright admitted this week look, I got it wrong, right? And we're going to try to fix it and adjust to it. And, you know, if more people would just do that part of it, you know, if instead of saying, I'm on this team or that team, and we're never going to admit we're wrong, if you're willing to admit you're wrong, you can repair things, you can okay, come I together, you know? But, yeah, but, you know, say, sainthood should require more than, oops, sorry, I fucked <laughs> up the economy. I mean, like, uh, really, you just... Uh... No. Well, come on, Charlie. That's not fair. I mean, by the, the when they did the American <laughs> Rescue Plan, they avoided everybody's fighting the last war, right? They wanted to avoid another slow Obama recovery, right? So we're going to pump a lot of money in. We're going to get. We're going to avoid the high unemployment, you know, people out of the labor force problem, which they did, and they went too far in the other direction. So it turns out they overcorrected, and now they're going to correct back. And yeah. I wish they hadn't screwed up, but you know, the, I just I just like secretaries of the Treasury who get it right. Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> whatever. I, I, th this has been frustrating. Um, I, I filled up my, my gas tank the other day and I don't have a massive gas tank. I think it's only 15 or 16 gallons. I mean, I don't have a you know giant car or anything like that. It cost me $82. <laughs> it was like, Oh, Oh my. All right. So, uh, people need to understand before people sneer at the impact of inflation on, in terms of politics, this is a game changer for a lot of families, a lot of middle-class families. Inflation is one of the most insidious things to happen to the economy. And I, 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 you know, the Biden white house seems they clearly understand it. I mean, they're saying this is their number one priority. I honestly do not know what at this point they can do. And, you know, blaming the, you know, greedy oil companies, you know, might set, you know, may scratch the itch, but I don't know that it's going to, that it's going to mean that next week or let me, since I'm not going to drive much anymore next month when I fill up again <laughs> and it costs me a hundred dollars to fill up my tank. Well, um, this hurts, but I really like that speech that, you know, <laughs> Ma M Mayor Pete's talking point really sort of resonated with me. Right. I don't know. I don't know what they can do. What, what can they do? I have good news for you, all right? And I have bad news. The good news yeah. is there is a cure for high prices. And the bad news is that the cure is high prices. <laughs> it's literally true. This is understood in economics, right? They, what, what happens is things are more expensive. People spend less. The economy cools down. It, eventually, that will work. But it's painful. It's painful. And this is a good reminder to progressives. Like, look, I agree with you, folks on the left. Like, the, the conservative economics, there was a lot of bullshit in supply side, right? There was a lot of smoke and mirrors. People said deficits didn't matter, et cetera, et cetera. Garbage. But it's, a useful, it's useful to remind progressives that there is this thing called inflation, that if you pump a lot of money into the economy, right, you can end up with, oh, you have 5% wage growth, which seems great, but you have 8% inflation, and therefore you're able to buy less with the, with the wages that you have. And that is just simple economics. And a lot of folks on the left who don't understand scarcity and don't understand trade-offs need to be aware that this happened in the 1970s. It's happening again now. Okay. So at the top of the show, you mentioned uh, Joe Manchin, a long story in the Washington Post about how close Joe Biden and, uh, and Manchin were to cutting a deal on Build Back Better. Uh, I still hate that slogan, but even when you like have all the details, there's still kind of stuff that makes you scratch your head that they put out a statement in that named Mansion that they were negotiating with him. Mansion had apparently told them, don't mention my name in the press release about the negotiations. I don't want a target on me to do that. It, they did anyway. It was a pretty anodyne statement, but he went ballistic, you know, saying that you are you know, I have threats against my family and myself and, uh, and, and blew everything up. And since then, um, that the domestic agenda has been pretty much dead. So what did you glean from that? Okay. So the take among my liberal friends was what a jackass Joe Manchin is that he let his personal peak over a, him, be, his name being included in some press release, tank the bill. Right. I, I kind of look at it the other way on after the 2020 election, right, Democrats, uh, after election day, they had 47 seats in the Senate, plus this guy in West Virginia who was in a Trump plus 40 state, I believe, you know, who's like caucusing with them. They're, they then managed somehow to win, squeak out these two runoffs in Georgia. Now they've got 50. If you, and they treated it like they had this enormous mandate. And they you when you are in that situation, you should be very thankful. You should be working with... Uh, it, instead of like complaining later on that we Joe Manchin got pissed off over a press release, you should be sending flowers to Joe Manchin every day because you desperately need that 50th vote. And if you're fighting for billions of, you know, trillions of dollars, you, yeah, so I, I think they, they should have handled this better and they should not have given him any pretext for bailing on the negotiations. Well, you are not just another pretty face, Will. I, that, because I, I, I continue to be amazed at um, the number of folks out there that thought that it was a good political tactic to essentially ignore the Republican Party for a year and beat up on two Democrats. You know, I, I, I was trying to make the case that, you know, following Kirsten Sinema into the ladies' room um, and harassing her and vilifying her is probably not the best uh, tactic when you have a 50-50 Senate, when you need her vote for everything. And by everything, I mean everything, everything. Um, and you look back on the last year 
and how much of how much energy uh, was spent in attacking Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, and letting the Republicans sit back in the easy chair in the Barco lounger eating popcorn? Because instead of focusing on them, they beat up on one another, and amazingly, um, it backfired. Amazingly, vilifying, threatening, and attacking someone like Joe Manchin was not a way to win his heart or his mind, and it blew up in their faces. I mean, if only they had been warned, if only they would have thought about it. I wish there was more introspection about all of this. I wish more people would listen to the point you just made, but I don't know. Um, but I but I think historians are going to look back on this, and they're gonna, they really will be puzzled by why the Democrats did not do the, the basic math, the, the basic math the way you just did it. And why there were so many hot takes about, well, with, you know, this is the opportunity to be FDR and LBJ. And if you don't go along with it, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to go to your house, but we're going to yell at you. We're going to scream at you because that's how we're going to get you to support our agenda. No, no, it doesn't work that way. Right. Meanwhile, every Republican in America that has voted no is going, yeah, didn't lay a glove on me at all. Right. And this this sort of brings us back to the previous conversation we were having about real politic internationally, right? Like you, yes. you have to be sensible. You have to be sensible. You take your allies where you can find them. You have bigger fish to fry. No one cares if you pass Build Back Better, whatever you want to call it, Charlie. If you pass these these programs, no one cares that you sucked up to Joe Manchin to do it. No one says that it was disgusting the way that you like bent over backwards and removed his name from a statement and whatnot. No one Nobody cares. cares. No one. Absolutely. So <laughs> suffer suffer the indignities to achieve the larger strategic objective. That's just a basic lesson for everyone. Let's leave it on that note, that positive, uplifting note of radical agreement. Uh, Will Salatin, thanks once again for joining me on a Monday morning in the worst of all possible timelines. Thanks, Charlie. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast, and we'll be back tomorrow to do this all over again. There are about a million podcasts about money, but Bad With Money with Gabby Dunn is the one where finances meet social justice. Investing in dating with Bella Gandhi. Do you believe that people should pay for dating apps? To me, invest in the dating process. There's nothing more important than finding the person you want to spend the rest of your life with. There's a stigma. Everything should be free. You're going to go to Whole Foods, meet eyes over mangoes, and all the dominoes fall in perfect order. That's just a load of garbage. Bad With Money. Listen, wherever you get your podcasts.